trust all of you are well. You've been well. You've had a good week. Uh, God is so good to us each and every day. And if we just took the time to look around us and to see and reflect what He is doing in and through us, we'd have ample opportunity, we'd have ample material for turning back and praising Him and giving Him glory. God said in the beginning six times that His creation was good. And then he, when he made man and when he made woman, he said it's very good. And we see that in Genesis 1 and there in the beginning of Genesis chapter 2. And that couple then lived in the land of Eden, in a paradise garden. And the purpose they had there, our first ancestors were supposed to tend that, and to work it, and to um, just walk in communion with their creator. But then evil slithered into the garden. And man and woman, through a chain of events, fell. We call that the fall. They sinned. And that sin has seriously affected all of us, all through the history of humanity. And it has, it's affected our relationships with each other in this world. It's, it's affected our relationship with our Creator to this very day. And so... Our world is a mess. Can I get an amen? amen? And it's our fault. It's our fault. Countries can't get along. Family members hold a lifetime of grudges against each other. People live with regrets every single day. Even the earth around us and beneath us suffers from a sickness played out in brutal weather and natural disasters. Well, what happened to the world? Why is all this so? Why did the world that God called good become so bad? And Genesis 3 gives us that answer. It tells us the reason why things went so wrong. Now, a choice was made in that garden that caused peace and perfection to be shattered like glass. And that glass has been shattered. Our lives, our world, our creation that God has given to us has been shattered into a million different pieces. And we still suffer the consequences of that choice today, right now, this morning. In our relationships, in our world, in our churches, in our workplaces, in our schools. We see the effects of it every single day. Well, we know it's sin, but what is sin? How do we define sin? Sin is transgressing God's commandments. God drew a line and we said, okay, we're going to cross that line. And once we cross that line, that's a transgression of God's law. If you'll look with me in Genesis 3, uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 6 to begin with. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So let's just pause there for a second. Okay, right off the bat, the first thing out of the serpent's mouth is what? Questioning God. Causing doubt. Tempting Eve to doubt what God has said. Now, it is also interesting that when Eve responds and answers this question, she got it partially right, didn't she? We're not supposed to eat it. But God also said, don't touch it. Now, when did God say that? He didn't. She's adding on to what God says. Every time you add on to what God says, you're going to get in trouble. Now, I don't know. I can't answer for you today. If all the animals talked, or this was a special occasion, or why in the world is Eve having this conversation with a snake? I don't know. She just starts answering them. Verse 4 says, The serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Now God had already said, The day that you eat it, you will surely die. And here's a blatant lie from Satan. You'll not die. Okay? Let's continue. Verse 5. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was where? Who was with her? Why didn't Adam speak up? Hmm. And he ate. They both ate. So how did temptation and sin relate to one another when we talk about doubt? Either talk, doubting God's word, doubting what God has said. You know, temptation and sin always finds their basis in unbelief. Not believing what God has said. Doubting that disobedience will actually bring consequences. Temptation can cause us to doubt, and doubts lead us to more temptation. It's cyclical. Doubts present opportunities to choose between rejecting God's word and obeying God's word in faithful obedience. So we define sin. We said sin is transgression. Okay, what is transgression? That means to cross over or to pass by. As I said, God gave us a, an absolute standard. And by the way, how many rules were there in the beginning? One thing of all the paradise of the garden that God had given them, there's only one thing he said, don't do. And that's what they did. You know, this, this word transgression, sin, it's used in reference to violating God's explicit commandments. Now, there's a, a, a thing, you know, we can, we can sin against God unintentionally. We may not know that we have violated his commandments. That's also sin. But when we talk about transgression, we know what to do. We know what is right. And yet we go and do the wrong thing anyway. That's transgression. And when God gives a specific command, as he did with Adam and Eve here, and when that command is disobeyed, transgression has taken place. So sin, we can define as breaking God's law. And what are the consequences? What does sin bring with it? Let's continue in Genesis 3. Sin will bring shame, and it will bring harm. Verse 7 says, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, Where are you? Now before this, Adam and Eve enjoyed the presence of God. They, they walked with God. They, they enjoyed. They, they couldn't wait to be in his presence. Something has happened. Adam hears the sound of God. He knows that God is there. He's, he's present. And what does he do? He runs and hides. Something drastic has happened. Now, when God asks this question, where are you? God knows exactly where he is. God knows where we are right now in this moment. But he wanted Adam to understand that he knew something had happened. That something terrible has happened. Verse 10 says, And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? You know, that, that one tree. Yes, he did. The man said, here's where the blame game starts, right? <laughs> the man said, well, this woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. So let's back up a little bit. Where was Adam again when I mean, this was going on? Right there. Not saying a word. Knowing full well what God had told him and commanded him not to do. Well, she gave it to me, and I ate it. The Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Now let's stop right there. Yes, the serpent tempted Eve, right? But is it the serpent's fault? 
absolutely is not the serpent's fault. Adam and Eve knew what they were doing, and they did it anyway. See, the lie of sin is that life will get better once we do or take whatever we want. And the truth is, is it won't. It will get drastically worse. The first man and the first woman quickly discovered that sin brings shame. All of a sudden, they knew that they were naked and there was something wrong with that. And they couldn't even put their finger on what that was, but something had happened. And they knew that sin brings harm. All of a sudden, they're blaming each other. They hadn't done that before. Now they're blaming God. And they're blaming everything around them. Harm comes into their relationship. Harm comes into their relationship with God. Before, when they heard God, they would run to him. Now, they're running away from God. And, and what did they try to do to hide from God and to cover their name and nakedness? They sowed fig leaves. And I don't know about you. I'm not much of a sower. But I sure wouldn't try to use fig leaves. <laughs> and running and hiding as if they could possibly get away from God. Now, sin and shame leads to a, a compound problem. As those who sin against God and others try to cover up and excuse their sin by blaming it on other people and even on God himself. This has not stopped <coughs> until this day. It still goes on every single day. One lie will lead to more lies. Blame is passed around all over the place. The buck is passed. And, and, and we can go down the list. You know, it's not my fault. It's my mama's fault. It's not my fault. It's my granddaddy's fault. It's not my fault. It's the devil's fault. It's not my fault I was born poor. It's not my fault uh, I, I, I'm having all this temptation around me. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's not my, it is your fault. It's my fault. We sin. And God says, when you sin, the consequences are very serious. And all attempts to cover up and run away from our sin and shame fail. They fail every single time. So three chapters into the Bible, we're already confronted with the, great, the greatest problem of humanity and the greatest problem of the world, sin and separation from God. And that sin brings. However, the good news is, God is not done with humanity. That's the good news. But, we need to recognize this morning, sin comes with a great consequence. A dire consequence. A terrible consequence. Let's look at verses 14 through 21. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. And on your belly you shall go. And dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And this might bring up some interesting questions too. And what kind of serpent was this? Verse 15, I'll put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. So you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. So sin comes at a great cost. You know, it, it damaged the relationships. The relationship with God was then broken because of sin. All of a sudden, death is entering into the world. We see here the first sacrifice being made. God knew those fig leaves would never cover them. And so he took skins. Some animals had to pay their life and clothe the man and the woman. God had already warned his image bearers that sin would come at a great cost, and that cost would be death. 
Human beings also experience other pains and struggles in life and relationships because of sin. And you know what? Everyone dies. And everyone dies as a result of sin. Marriage is suffering in various ways, or the marriage ends altogether. There are bitterness, backbiting, power struggles all around us. The work has become a toil. And understanding the cost of sin is an important aspect of our spiritual life. Because not only do we die physically because of sin, but spiritual death happens as well. But God is gracious in revealing to us the weight of that sin and the cost of that sin and the consequences of that and all the harm that it brings. God is gracious to tell us the truth about that and to tell us what we need to do about that. He's gracious to reveal to us the one way that we cannot be condemned for our sin. And that's through Jesus who, if you look again at verse 15, will crush the serpent's head. Crushing. In the midst of pronouncing judgment, God also promised hope for humanity. Let's read verse 15 again. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Do we call this the proto evangelium? That's just a fancy word that means first gospel. It's the first announcement of the gospel to the world. That something God has put in motion, some plan he has, that this is not the end of the story. So it's the first gospel announcement. Yes, Satan will bruise Christ. He will go to the cross. But that's not the end of the story. He comes out of that grave alive. And because of it, we have all the hope in the world. And so when we look at Genesis, Genesis the Genesis account is not a myth. It's the gracious revelation of God that explains who we are, who we are, and how we got where we are. And we are God's marvelous creation. We are his image bearers. We're created in his image. But the problem is we've rebelled against him as humanity. Adam and Eve sinned first, but all of us are implicated in sin. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Word all means everyone, all of us. And the first step in our response to God's offer of salvation through the gospel is a full recognition of our deep sinfulness. We don't recognize that we can't be saved. We all have fallen short of God's holy standard. And the wages of sin, he tells us, is death. And there's a lot more worse death than physical death. Spiritual death, death is ultimately worse. And the worst part of that is total separation from the presence of God. Those are the most tragic of circumstances. In fact, this is ultimately what makes hell so torturous. It's not all the punishments. Those are bad enough. But it's the fact that that person will never be able to experience the presence of God and have a relationship. And separation from God is exactly what sin ultimately causes. Our sin is no small matter. So we look all around us and we listen to people constantly trying to redefine what sin is and constantly say, well, it's not that bad. Actually, it's a good thing. Don't listen to them. They are poison you. We cannot trifle with it. What must we do? We must repent. We must repent of our sins. Some of you here this morning have been playing around with God. You may have been playing around with God your whole life. You might be doing it right now. But let me tell you something. Jesus Christ was not playing around with you. And he was not playing around with sin when he hung on that cross. And we need to remember that. And thankfully, God is merciful. And thankfully, God is gracious to us. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And in his son, Jesus Christ, God has provided a remedy, the cure... The solution for our sin. The massive heart of Christ stands ready always to forgive. And all we have to do is come to him with our hands held out in faith. And responding to his free gift of salvation. Now, it's free to us. But it cost him dear. It cost him his life. 
Now imagine for a moment that you have received a very expensive, super nice, top of the line electronic gift. It does all the cool things that you never knew that you couldn't live without. But now, somehow, you can't live without it. And you have some friends over to your house, and you decide, well, I'm going to bring this gift out, and I'm going to show it to them. And you kind of pass it around, and one of them wants to take a closer look at it. And they're waving it around everywhere. I say, you know what, I want to go show this to my wife. And they go outside where some more people are, and, hey, look at this. And they walk by the pool, and as they're waving around, it goes right into the pool. Plop. Instantly, this gadget is destroyed. Even though you warned a friend to be careful with it, even though you told them this is very sensitive equipment, don't do anything to damage it, as soon as it plopped in the water, it is destroyed. Now, you have at this point two options. You can either lash out at your friend in rage and demand that he repay what he broke, or you can forgive your friend and take on the responsibility for yourself. What are you going to do? But to replace the item, somebody is going to have to pay for it, right? And in forgiving, what you're saying is, I agree to pay for it. I'm taking on that cost. And in a similar manner, God took responsibility to pay for our sin because we couldn't do it. Not in a million years, we couldn't pay for our own sin. Our sin wasn't merely a problem to solve. It was a debt to pay. And so many times you see sin equated to a debt that we can't pay. In Christ, God sent his only son to pay the cost that we incurred, that we drove up. Forgiveness is always a costly matter. Someone always suffers. And how amazing is it that the suffering one, in this case, was God himself. For God so loved the world, for God so loved you, and God so loved me that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father God, we pray that each one of us has examined our hearts and we've invited you to examine our hearts and Lord, to expose our sin to ourselves and that we confess it to you and repent of it. Father, trusting you for what you did on the cross through your son Jesus Christ, who took all the sins of the world and paid the consequence, not just physically, spiritually. Lord, we have violated your laws, but Jesus came and paid for that. And you say if we believe in your son and what he's done for us, and we get to have a relationship with you, we get to have ex uh, experience forgiveness, and we get to have life evermore, life to the abundance. So we, we're thankful for that. We are so thankful, Lord, that you've told us the truth. You've not left us to our own devices. And you set in motion a plan long ago so that we can experience salvation and eternal life. Father, if there's anybody here today who, who has needed to hear those words and to turn to you in faith and respond to you just trusting that that is the case, that that is reality, where they'll just simply take out, uh, reach out and take that gift from you, repenting of their sins and trusting Jesus as Lord and Savior. And we pray for them this morning that that would be the case. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for your great, great love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.